What's up, my wizards? It's Dev, SBMTG down there. We like magic, all that stuff, you know, by now. I gotta get to these core set spoilers, though, because yet again, there's a buttload of them. There's a lot of cool stuff to talk about. So let's get it started with what reprints we got to see today. We didn't get to see a whole lot of them, and they're not super high priced this time, but they're still exciting. Well, today brought us Enigma Drake, Phylactery Lich, and Banefire. Banefire's back, and I'm super happy about that. I would have taken Blaze. But we instead got Banefire, which is one of the best iterations of a Red X spell almost just about ever. I mean, there's really not much. Um, maybe two or three cards that are better at doing what Banefire does than Banefire. So super happy to see this card back. And I wouldn't be surprised if this actually saw a good amount of play, especially maybe in the sideboard against Control or something like that. Um, especially after Commit to Memory rotates, because that's a good answer for this, but really, they don't have a whole lot of other good answers. So, happy to see Banefire back. I think it'll actually do a lot of work. The other two cards, I'm not so sure about. Enigma Drake has always been an awesome card. I'm glad it's seeing a reprint. You know, it's not really leaving standard at all. And I think that's really cool. You know, Blue Red Spells decks, this has always been a great finisher for them. So, I'm glad they're still going to have it as an option. As far as Phylactery Lich, though, eh, you know. Um, it's not like, I think this card's like 35 cents. It didn't necessarily need a reprint. And it doesn't see all the play in the world in like Commander or anything. Um, but I will say in Commander it goes good with like Dark Stealing it and other indestructible artifacts. But it's just so easy to get your Lich killed. And then what happens, you know? And this is true even in Standard. Um, like right now, I just don't think it's a good time to play Phylactery Lich while we're, a Braid is such an important card, so... I'm just not really sure that I care that much about this reprint, but I know that there are some players out there that just love Phylactery Lich, and we're happy to have it back, but mostly I'm really excited about the Drake, and especially Banefire. Really good to have a really solid Red X spell in the format again. We also got to see a cycle of Uncommon Gold cards in Limited. In fact, Enigma Drake is part of this Uncommon Gold cycle, but some of the other pieces are Regal Bloodlord and Skyrider Patrol for starters. Regal Bloodlord just looks fine, especially again in Limited where if you can create the life gain deck in draft or something, this will probably give you a good amount of extra value. Plus, I like the idea that you can play this on turns where you've already gained life and get that extra bat the same turn you play it. Skyrider Patrol looks really good in Limited too. obviously. The stat line isn't as good as the other flyers that we've seen so far in this video. 4-minute 2-3 flyer, not great, but it does have an ability that we keep seeing in recent Limited environments where it has the ability to give other creatures flying, but in this case, it's a really good form of the ability. I don't necessarily like that it costs mana to do this, but I do like that you can do it without Skyrider ever actually having to attack. This just occurs at the beginning of combat in your turn. So you don't even have to swing in with Skyrider to give something else flying. And that's really nice. Plus, the creature gets a plus one, plus one counter. So the longer the game goes on, the bigger your guys get. They don't just get flying every combat step. So I think there's plenty to like about Skyrider Patrol, but specifically just in Limited. The other two cards we've seen in this cycle so far, I think are actually a little bit better for constructed play, but probably won't make the cut at the end of the day. But they're at least better than Bloodlord or Skyrider Patrol. The other two cards in this cycle are Heroic Reinforcements and Poison Tipped Archer. Um, Heroic Reinforcements, maybe not so much for constructed play, but I really like uh, how they designed this card. You know, it's four mana to get two... 1-1 one, one tokens, which isn't necessarily great, but the rest of the card, pretty nice. Until end of turn, creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and gain haste. So the two tokens you just created are both two twos with haste, which makes that four mana actually not the worst rate. But I saved Poison Tip Archer for last for a reason. I like this card the most for constructed play by a mile. And I'm not saying it makes constructed play, but we really needed some sort of Blood Artist kind of effect. I keep seeing these aristocrat type decks, you know, I've pointed them out two or three times that we have a few different sacrifice effects, especially just in Corset. Um, a lot of them are red, don't get me wrong, but obviously we've got black-green saplings. There's a green-white tokens deck that could just play black to get this effect too. So we've already got tokens decks in the format that could want to play something like this. And along with something like Slimefoot, I can see this really piling on the damage, and it doesn't have the disadvantage of Slimefoot, where you can't have more than one Slimefoot out at the same time. You know, as many copies of, of PTA as you want out on the battlefield at the same time. So I could really see stacking those dice triggers and getting a lot of, you know, damage in all at one time. But here's where we reach the stuff that I think is actually worth talking about. On camera to you guys, here's Stitcher's Supplier right here, which doesn't look like much at first, but I think this card is actually really good. It's just one black mana for a 1-1 one, one zombie, and when it enters the battlefield or dies, put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard. 
well, it's just great for a lot of stuff, you know. I think this is better than Minister of Inquiries for Godfrey's Gift decks right now. Uh, just immediately get that into the battlefield trigger in mill three. That's fantastic. And then as soon as it blocks in combat, and it probably will against a lot of decks in the format, that's another mill three for yourself. That's great. Whether you're trying to, you know, abuse Godfrey's Gift or even get a search for Asconta going. There's a few reasons in standard my, why you might want this. Much less like reanimator strategies. This is an easy way to put cards in the yard. Just self mill decks that want to play in their yard are always looking for really cheap effects that do this. And this is a great way to do it. Just one mana for that kind of self mill and and a chump blocker? Yeah, I'll take that all day. This card is way better than it looks. Incoming translation here. In fact, the next three cards will all need a translation. So if their names change at some point in the near future, don't blame me. But in any case, first thing we're going to look at is Departed Deckhand, which is cool because it's a pirate. We don't haven't seen too many of those since Ixalan, but it's two mana, one in the blue for a 2-2 spirit pirate. And when Departed Deckhand becomes the target of a spell, sacrifice it. Departed Deckhand can only be blocked by spirits. And if you pay three and a blue, target creature you control can only be blocked by spirits this turn. I kind of like it for standard because there's really not a whole lot of spirits <laughs> at all. That's So there's really not a whole lot that's going to be able to block this, period. So I think that's pretty cool. And let's be fair here. Like, just about anything they would target it with is going to kill it anyway. You know, just close to anything they could target it with is going to kill it anyway. Like, Shock's going to kill it, Lightning Strike, whatever. So, I don't really care about the semi-illusion ability right there. Um, that's actually not that bad. So, that's, you know, you can't, like, enchant it or anything yourself, but whatever. It's still free two damage just about every turn. Uh, that's good to play on curve, you know, it's good for pirate synergies and stuff like that. So, I don't know that the card is real, and I really don't think that this is the piece pirates needs to be a deck. I would doubt that highly. But I still think that it's good design, and they jammed a lot onto a, a bear, basically a two-mana 2-2. Two, two, you know, so I, I don't think the card is bad. It's a decent mana sink, too, in the late game to get a creature, or even two, depending on how late it is, um, through. Plus, you'll always get, like, this through and whatever you make unblockable with it as well. So this could be a great late-game mana sink for some extra reach to get some damage through. I mean, there, there's a lot that I like about this card. Again, another one that looks unassuming at first glance, but it's just a bear with upside, and there's nothing wrong with that. Up next is Graveyard Marshal, another good two drop. This is two black mana for a 3-2 zombie soldier. You can pay two and a black and exile a creature card from your graveyard to create a tapped 2-2 black zombie creature token. This is just good. This is fine, you know. A lot of the things I've seen about this card have mostly been people saying, like, this is good in zombies. This is good no matter what. This is just good, <laughs> you know. Um, this won't necessarily, like, replace Scrap Heap Scrounge or anything when, it, when it's gone, but it's still a two-mana 3-2 three, two, that black decks can play, and instead of getting itself out of the graveyard, it sort of gets other creatures out of the graveyard, or at least gets you value from creatures that have gone there. Um, it also can be used at instant speed, and instant speed board presence is very nice. Um, just doing this once a turn for a couple of turns is going to get you tons and tons of value and, you know, a, a board presence just in one card, effectively, as long as you have a couple of dudes in your graveyard to start things off. So, I like this. I like it. I know it can just be shocked, but still, a 2-mana 3-2 is more or less good enough on its own. Plus, it's got the ability to just, like, give you more board presence. Whoops. So, like, this is... Another fantastic two drop that'll probably see play at some point. But the hits just keep on coming. Check out Runic Armasaur. This is one of my favorite cards of the day, as a matter of fact. It's three mana, one and two green for a two five dinosaur. And whenever an opponent activates an ability of a creature or land, if it isn't a mana ability, you may draw a card. Now, this actually draws cards off of a lot of stuff in not just standard, but also modern. Like, all I really have to tell you in modern is that this draws your card whenever they crack a fetch. So that seems good, and you can get it off Collected Company. Not bad. Uh, but in Standard, there's also a ton of stuff. Um, even if it's not immediately apparent, but some of the best cards in the format, like Walking Ballista, the Scarab God, Hazaret. I mean, these are fantastic cards, and you draw a card whenever anybody uses any of their abilities. Plus, there's a ton of lands and stuff right now, even just in Standard, again. You know, Field of Ruin, Scavenger Grounds, uh, all the deserts, like Hashep Oasis, Ifni Rivulet, Chefet Dunes, Ifnir Deadlands, all that. Um, oh gosh, 
What else? Because there's a ton. There's a ton. Arch of Arazka, um, Flipped Ascanta, Ascanta the Sunken Ruin. I mean, there are more more than enough things that this works against. But even if it never draws you your card, it's a 3-mana 2-5 that can't be killed by Chandra, can't be killed by Glorybringer, blocks through the majority of important threats in the early game. Um, you know, it can't be killed by, let's say, Lightning Strike and Goblin Chain Whirler on the same turn. That's an important thing. So there's just, this thing survives so much against Mono Red, it's going to block all day. And when they finally get their Hazaret, you'll eventually draw some cards. Not to mention you can draw cards off of like Bomat Courier's activation, maybe Fanatical Firebrand if they're playing it in that deck. So there's, this card does an awful lot for you in terms of not just like surviving in the early game and blocking forever, but also, you know, getting some, get, getting some gas, keeping up the cards in your hand in the mid and late game. I really like so much about this creature, not to mention the fact it's a Another playable dinosaur. So sign me up. This thing looks great. Here's Psy Master Thopterist. It's three mana, two, and a blue for a 1 4 legendary human artificer. Whenever you cast an artifact spell, create a 1 1 colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying. That's so many words to say create a Thopter. Um, and you can also pay one and a blue to sacrifice two artifacts and draw a card. This looks really good to me in a lot of ways, you know? Um, I was just talking about the Etherflux Reservoir deck. It's possible they might want this. It's like an alternate win condition or a way to sacrifice artifacts and draw cards in the late game if they absolutely need to. Plus, it's a legendary creature that enables Mox Amber um, in that deck and in any deck if you want to enable a Mox Amber. This is actually one of the best ways to do that because you play Psy and then you play Mox Amber. Get yourself a Thopter. You can tap your Mox Amber for stuff. So, all that's really good. Um, and people are even talking about this being modern playable. Not 100% sure. They're just saying that because it survives Bolt. And you have to have that conversation in Modern if a creature survives Lightning Bolt. Um, but I'm not too sure about there. It may be a little bit too slow. But I don't know my Modern that well. So who knows? Maybe I'm just a, an idiot. But in Standard, I definitely think this has real applications. Especially while Kaladesh Block is still around. And we've got so many artifacts to play with. This could probably make you a field full of Thopters really, really quickly. Whether or not that's worth it in a format with Chain Whirler... I'm not super sure, but at least Psy doesn't die to Goblin Chain Whirler, so there's always that. And she blocks Chain Whirler. I should point that out, too. So, all of that is good. Got my eye on this card. I don't know why I called it a she. That's obviously a gnarly mustache right there. I don't know how I missed that, but still. Psy looks fine. That's all I'm saying. But let's bring it down for a minute with Chaos Wand right here. This is just three mana for an artifact. You can pay four and tap it to have target opponent exile cards from the top of their library until they exile an instant or sorcery card. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Then put the exiled cards that weren't cast this way on the bottom of that library in a random order. This card just seems really fun. You know, I'm not sure that it's competitive in any way, although I will say any deck can play it, and it seems like it might be sort of theoretically okay against control, but... You don't really want to spin up one of their removal spells. You don't have to cast it, but there's probably not going to be anything of theirs you can cast it on. So, you know, unless you somehow roulette wheel up a glimmer of genius or something, it's probably not going to be that worth it, to be honest. Um, but in Commander, though, T-H-O, I think this is probably really good, or at least people are going to have a lot of fun with it in Commander. So, again, not sure how competitive this card is at all, um, especially with the four activation costs. That's so much to activate um, but it can be done at instant speed. So, like, once you have it out, why not do it at the end of your opponent's turn? And why not do it to respond to whatever they're doing? So, I don't know. I, I like the idea behind the card. Um, and I, I sort of like the idea of, you know, there's this sort of long-standing tradition of printing a few janky artifacts, not on, only in every set, but especially in core sets. So, I, I think we're just continuing that tradition. But again, EDH players, let me know how you feel about this, because I got a feeling this is... Pretty sweet in your format. Also want to sneak a look at Suspicious Bookcase right here. This is two mana for a 0-4 artifact creature. It's a wall. It has Defender, and you can pay three and tap it to have target creature not be blocked this turn. This is just the best flavor of any card I've seen in, like, so long, it feels like. So, mm, mm, yes, delicious. Delicious flavor on this thing. I feel like we should have had this card in, like... 94 you know like this card i don't i just feel like i don't i don't know why it's been so long since we've missed printing the trope of of a revolving you know bookcase or suspicious bookcase that's just really cool that we we finally got this trope let me just say that um and I, it's perfectly designed uh so i really i just like a lot about this again it's not a very 
uh, competitive card, but it is at the very least. Um, you know, a two-mana 0-4 early game blocker that then serves to get bigger guys through in the late game. So I don't know. Um, I like this more than, what is it, like a Glimmering Barrier or Glittering Barrier, whatever it is. The 0-4 two-mana artifact that gets you a treasure when it dies. I think I like this way better, and I have played Glittering Barrier in the sideboard of artifact decks to block aggro creatures before in, in budget decks. So I think this could serve a similar function. It might show up in a budget list at some point. Don't be surprised if it does. But up next, I'm pretty excited about this. This is Valiant Knight right here. It's four mana, three and a white for a three, four human knight. Other knights you control get plus one, plus one. And it's got a mana sink ability. Pay three and two white. That's five. Knights you control gain double strike until end of turn. Ooh wee. This looks pretty sweet for just mono white knights, but also black white knights, obviously, right? Um, this, the floor on this is pretty low. You know, you play it turn four and they just kill it and you don't get any value off of it. You know, they kill it before the attack step. Um, but anything other than exactly that result is really good. And honestly, it's kind of tough for them to kill it. Uh, you know, depending on what they're playing, like a braid doesn't kill it. Lightning strike doesn't kill it. They have to revolt their fatal push. I mean, there's, there's lots of removal spells that are really popular right now that this effectively blanks. So that's, that's fantastic. You know, just really, really good Night Lord right here. The Anthem effect is sweet, especially when it follows up a Banalish Marshal, because now you've just got all the Anthems in the world. Plus, on your next turn, provided that you get your fifth land drop, you can just give all your Knights double strike. Bing, bang, finish the game off right there, you know? That goes really well with history, um, especially well with history if you got it on turn three. And if you go turn three history, turn four this, turn five, history goes off. Um, and not only do your knights get the boost from history, but they get the anthem from this. Um, and you still have the mana to give all your knights double strike. It's just, if they don't have Settle the Wreckage, the game is over. You're dealing well over 20 damage in that situation. Like, well over their starting life total, even if you haven't hit them yet. So, I can really see this card working well with not only Marshall, but also history and literally every other knight in the deck. So, it's just insane to me. Um, again, the floor is pretty low if they have the removal in their hand, but you're really forcing them to. If they don't, and you get to actually untap with this in play, the eh, chances you're going to win the game go drastically up. So I'm really liking the, the way that, you know, at least mono white or white black knights um, are shaping up right now. This is a great piece for them. Speaking of knights, we also got to see Lena, Selfless Champion. This is six mana, four and two white for a 3-3 legendary human knight. And when it enters the battlefield, you create a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token for each non-token creature that you control. And if you sacrifice her, creatures you control with power less than Lena's power gain indestructible until end of turn. All right, so first things first, she'll always see herself when she, when she gets her ETB trigger. So you'll always at least get the one soldier off of her. It's not bad. But it's obviously pretty easy to create board states where this gets you a bunch of creatures when it enters the battlefield. I like that about it. So maybe, but six mana is an awful lot. Again, that enter the battlefield trigger is desirable enough to maybe want to pay six mana. Plus, I like the fact that she can protect smaller things um, and the tokens she creates from Fumigates and Cleansing Hope or Cleansing Ray. Um, whatever the new white sweeper is that we just previewed last night. So um, that's decent, but I also I don't like that she comes down a turn or even two, depending on if you're on the play or the draw, after the Fumigate. So that's not great, but later on in the game, she can protect from at least some sweepers, and that could be really important. Altogether, again, six mana is so freaking much. So much, especially for a card that's ostensibly going to go in an aggro deck, right? Um, I, still, I don't see Mono White Aggro playing too many six drops, but if they were going to, this would definitely be the one, but I'm just not convinced. I am not sold. But let's get on to some more exciting stuff. we got Goblin Trash Master right here. What a name for a card. Goblin Trash Master. It's four mana, two, and two red for a 3-3 three, three Goblin Warrior. And look at that first line of text. Other goblins you control get plus one, plus one. We've been waiting for that. And you can also sacrifice a goblin to destroy target artifact. Well, first of all, maybe playable in modern. I have heard some people say that just because of the sacrifice a goblin, bust an artifact ability. That seems to be what people like about this in modern, but I don't really care that much. I think, as far as standard goes, obviously we've been waiting on our goblin lord 
And this looks like what we're going to get. And while things like Heart of Kirin and just Kaladesh block in general are still in standard, this could be a really, really important second ability on the card, too. And note, too, that it's another way to sacrifice goblins. You know, we've got Siege King Commander, we've got now um, Dark Dweller Oracle, and um, Skirk Prospector, just all the good goblins in standard. Count on sacrificing goblins. So I'll say it again, Goblin Aristocrats totally work. Um, just yet another thing to let you get free sacrifice triggers or dies triggers if you want them. So I like this card. I'm going to do even at a whopping four mana. I We have to play it. But it's not like, you know, I feel like I'm forced to play the card. I'm kind of happy about being able to play the card. But up next, here's the big boy, Arcades, the Strategist. It's four mana, one, and Bant colors for a 3-5 Flying Vigilance. And whenever a creature with Defender enters the battlefield under your control, you draw a card. Each creature you control with Defender assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power and can attack as though they didn't have a Defender. Found a use for Suspicious Bookcase. It, go, it goes in this deck, at least. Um, and honestly, four mana for a 3-5 Flying Vigilance? Not the worst deal in the world. You know, this can block uh, the new bolus. So there's that. Um, blocks glory bringers and stuff. And can't be hit by glory bringer. Because it's a dragon. Keep that in mind. Blocks rekindling phoenix and stuff. And then can stay. It can it can attack into phoenix. Um, and then still block it if it needs to. the next turn. So, I don't know, man. There's I kind of think it's not terrible. We obviously don't have a bunch of creatures with defender in the format right now. Or at least a bunch of playable good ones that you want to fill your deck with. So... As far as the rest of the text on this card goes, I'm not sure, but drawing cards off of Creature with Defender actually sounds pretty decent. If you have some good creatures with Defender. Again, big if. Uh, but it's really sweet to get the, the Assault Formation ability back, too. You know, sort of the, the Doran ability. Um, I really like having that ability back in Standard. Assault Formation was super fun to build with last time we had it in Standard, and it wasn't a half-bad deck either. So, definitely going to give this a shot. Hope we see more support for it, but... In the meantime, a 4-mana 3-5 flyer that blocks most of the things in the format and can just attack through them too and stay up to block them. I mean, I think that's almost a good enough deal. We'll just have to get a decent Bant deck going. Up next is Demanding Dragon. This is actually a relatively controversial card today. Um, this is 5-mana, 3 and 2 red for a 5-5 dragon with flying. And when it enters the battlefield, it deals 5 damage to target opponent unless that player sacrifices a creature. Now, I've seen people call this bad, and I don't get it. There's a guy on um, there's a guy on the uh, Spikes post for this card that's just like, I don't want people to ever think this card is good. It's absolutely unplayable trash. And it's like, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's a 5-5 five, five flying dragon with upside. Um, and the upside is a Punisher mechanic, but it's a really, really good one. Um, you know, I've seen people say, like, oh, this just eats a token. Uh, but no one's playing tokens right now, dude. Like, Goblin Chain Whirler is the most important card in the format, and it's put just about everyone except other mono red decks off of playing X1s. So this is probably never just going to eat a token, at least, you know, for the next, the entire time it's in standard. Um, so I, just, I wouldn't worry about that too much. And even if it does eat a token, people are pretending like that's not extra value. You still, you know, two for one, you still got a creature on your side of the board and took a creature away from them. That's still, you know, increasing your board presence and detracting from theirs. One of the best things you can do in Magic. So, if, you're, if your excuse for why this card is, quote, bad is because it just eats a token all the time, every time, that's not, even that is not a good enough excuse. Um, I just, I really like the card, to be honest with you. It's got a form of haste and a form of vigilance, as a matter of fact, because it can deal the five damage to turn it into the battlefield, yet not attack, so it stays up to block. That's pretty good, right? Against control, they'll almost never have a creature to sacrifice. So they're just going to get domed for five when you play this, and they have to remove it, or they're going to continue. They're going to continue to get domed for five every single turn. Um, but it just seems good. And if they do have a Torrential Gear Hulk or something out, uh, then they have they either sacrifice it, and they have the choice to sacrifice it, um, or get hit. So, I don't know. Five mana, five, five flyer is decent. I also saw somebody, by the way, um, compare this to Archfiend of Ifnir. Like, well, Archfiend of Ifnir is a 5 4 fly 5 and it doesn't see any play. It also doesn't have an end of the battlefield trigger that's any good um, and, and at, at all, period. And 4 toughness versus 5 toughness is huge 
in a format with Glorybringer, which can kill an Archfiend of Ifnir, and Chandra, which can kill an Archfiend of Ifnir, but neither of which can kill this card. Um, just the difference between four toughness and five toughness in this particular standard format is enormous, and you should know that. Uh, if, if, if you don't, it's, it's, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. So I just think the card looks not necessarily phenomenal while Glorybringer's in the format, but once it rotates out and we now have this as a choice instead, I think it's just, I think it's going to be, I definitely think it's going to see play. Um, I don't see why it wouldn't, especially with a real Dragon's Day shaping up. I mean, an actual real Dragon's Day, you'll see why in a second, um, is actually really shaping up. So I, I expect this card to see at least a little bit of play, um, or at least some testing, <laughs> you know. Um, I just see no problem. Five mana, five, five flyer is at least decent, more or less, by itself. It's not standard playable by itself. But you know what it is? A crazy enter the battlefield trigger on that. So I like it. I got I have no qualms liking this card. Uh, I don't understand if you don't like it. I really don't. So let me know if you do or don't in the form in, in the comments section. Because this is probably one of the most polarizing cards of the entire day. But I just don't see anything to fuss about. Should really calm down after that. Gotta get my blood pressure in the right place. But that's gonna be tough. Because they're gonna talk about this three mana planeswalker. Here's Sarkin Fireblood. He's one and two red for a three loyalty walker. And you can plus one it to discard a card if you do draw a card. You can also plus one it to add two mana in any combination of colors to your mana pool. Spend this mana only to cast dragon spells. You can also minus seven him to create four five five dragon creature tokens with flying. Well, to me, honestly, the plus one makes this card. Uh, it's not quite a loot. Instead, it's a rummage, is what we call that. Um, discarding the card first. But that's fine, especially for decks that want to discard cards, which I can definitely picture more than one of, especially while Godfrey's Gift, Scare of God, all these cards are still in the format. Um, obviously, that will require some, some finagling with the colors, but it's totally possible. There are reanimation elements in this format right now that you'll, you wouldn't mind discarding a card at all. So it's almost a... I mean, you could turn it into an upside quickly, is all I'm saying. But the ability to more or less, you know, cycle or filter cards for plus one on a three mana planeswalker, I have no problem with that. That seems good. You know, uh, leaving leaving that though, I'm not really sure how much I like it. It doesn't protect itself at all, uh, which is something I really, really look for in a planeswalker. So there is that. But again, you know, if if you've got shocks and abrades and lightning strikes in the early game that might not be too much of a problem uh but that's again might is the operative word in that sentence um because i could definitely see a situation where even though you're ticking this up to four the turn it enters the battlefield uh it can still just be attacked into for four damage the next turn that's not too uncommon in this format so you know especially with like goblin chain whirler that'll that'll deal damage to planeswalkers too so it's pretty it's pretty easy to for for your opponent to manage this thing's loyalty cost, even this early in the game. But the other plus one is cool, and I like the fact that he's got two plus ones. Um, other than the ultimate, you'll never minus this Planeswalker, which is pretty nice on a three-mana Planeswalker. It gives you choice. Um, and if we see, you know, a, a two-mana Dragon at all, then that makes Sarkin really, really good, because obviously in your third turn, Sarkin, free Dragon. I doubt that we'll see that, to be honest with you. Uh, but just in case we do, that's a pretty sweet playline. Um, but obviously, on your next turn, if you get your land drop, then you can play a six-drop dragon on turn four. And that does seem pretty nice, because there's a ton of really, really good six-drop dragons. Not to mention, you can just play a four- or five-drop dragon and have mana up at that point. You know, two mana... If you play a four-drop dragon on your next turn, you still have two mana up for a braid or lightning strike. That's a pretty important thing to be able to do. Um, or, you know, in other decks, let's say you play a five-drop dragon, like a Glorybringer on turn four through your Sarkin. Well, you've still got mana up at that point for Fatal Push or Shock or whatever. So a lot of interesting play lines available with Sarkin right now. I think this is a pretty decent three mana walker, even though, again, I'll say it again, doesn't protect itself, and I think that's a huge problem, um, especially for a, a walker that you play so early in the game. Uh, so, you know, I got, I got issues there. I got issues, but in the right deck, Sarkin actually looks pretty stacked, you know? His ultimate doesn't just win the game by itself. Uh, they can always fumigate or whatever, board wipe, settle the wreckage, blah, blah. There's a ton of things they can do against the ultimate, but not a bad ultimate either. You know, they are forced to have those answers or you're just going to win. So there's that too. Uh, but my favorite thing about this card is the plus one. And if there was one thing about it that makes it playable, it's probably that ability. So 
I don't, I'm not going to poo poo on this. This is another card that's been really polarizing all day. Um, people loving it, people hating it. I'm sort of on the fence and in the middle. I'd say I'm 60% I like this card, 40% I don't. But anyway, we got one more card to talk about today, and it actually just reloaded into Mythic Spoiler because um, I wanted to check and make sure that we weren't done. Turns out we're not done. So let's take a look at Disdainful Pyromancer right here to cap things off for this video. This is two mana, one in red for a 2-2 two -two human wizard. Peep that creature type. You can pay a red and tap it, discard a card, and draw a card. So another rummager. Or you can pay two in a red and tap it to sacrifice Disdainful Pyromancer and deal four damage to a creature. This is awesome. <laughs> you know, I've, again, I've only just now seen this card for like the first time. So I don't have like researched opinions or anything. I haven't like had a million years to think about this card or even five minutes to think about this card. So I'm not sure about specific stuff, but let's just say that a two mana 2-2 two -two in red used to be relatively rare. Like not even that long ago. We didn't see that. Uh, very often, but now we're seeing them and this one has extreme upside. It's got two different good Activated abilities on it, you know the ability for your you know your bear to be able to kill a much bigger creature in the late game I mean, let's put it this way You know if you played a two drop that could effectively trade with a bigger creature on you know, a, you know one of their four drop for instance uh, then That'd be a really good two drop, right? Well, you can do that. That's exactly what Pyromancer does um, and it'd be really good to reanimate or maybe bring back with God for his gift or the Scarab God, you know, you bring back a 4-4 four, four that's still capable of blowing stuff off the board. It's a really good activated ability. Um, and that's not even touching the rummaging ability, you know, just one red mana and tap it to filter cards is, is also very, very good. And this goes in the Wizards deck. It's a good two-drop wizard. So, I mean, this will, be, this will see play somewhere, right? I don't see why it wouldn't. It just does. Two really important decent things you know both draw and and removal in one card like that's i just not i'm not sure what's not to like about this card to be honest i just can't come up with any like cons i can only come up with pros um i guess maybe you could say it's slow you know it's a two mana two two that doesn't do anything it doesn't hate on anything um they can just shock it and you know be done with it before you can really do anything with it i guess um, let's let's continue talking myself out of it let's see um, on turn three, that's the earliest you can get value from this. Um, and then you'll have to pay at least one mana into it. Um, at which point you can only afford to play a two drop on turn three. So you're losing uh, theoretical tempo at least. So I don't know, maybe, but still, still you guys, I mean, it's a two drop with a, si a decent body for its mana cost. Um, and two really good activated abilities. So again, I can try to talk myself out of it all I want. This is obviously a very good card. I'm pretty sure we're safe. Pretty sure we're safe. I've reloaded one more time just to be sure, but I, I think we're done. Um, and that was a lot of cards, you guys, and a lot of them are really, really good. So we had a lot to talk about today. And I don't know if you've noticed yet, but, like, Corset's looking stacked. Like, Corset's looking like a really good set. In fact, dare I say, possibly a better set than Dominaria, from what I can tell. There are just so many high-powered cards in this set that I am loving either... You know, just obviously on a raw power level, like this is an obviously good card. Or on like a, a level of like weird, maybe suspect playability. Like, is this card good enough? Like, there's there's a bunch of cards that I like on different levels um, in this set. And I am really liking the way this thing's uh, shaping up so far. So let me know how you felt about all these in the comments section and core set in general um, so far. Because again, I think it's a slam dunk. It's a grand slam. Up to now, at the very least. I mean, every other card they print in this set could be garbage, and I'd still be happy with the set, to be honest with you. So, let me know how you feel about that, too. Like the video if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you haven't done that yet. Make sure you hit the bell for the notifications, because there's still a bunch more spoiler videos. And after spoilers are done, you're going to start making decks, and that's probably what you're really interested in. So, make sure you're subbed. Follow me on Twitter at SBMTGDev. Check out my sponsor, TCG Player. They help keep the lights on. I'll leave the first link in the description so you can do that. And kind of check out where we are as far as a barometer for pre-order prices right now. Or if you just want to go ahead and pre-order anything for, um, for Corset 2019. TCG Player's got your back. Lowest price you can order, not only singles um, for, t for this set, but also um, sealed product. You know, last I checked, boxes had crept up a little over $90, but they'll get up to 100 obviously, so you might want to go ahead and pre-order a box or two because the set is looking fire. 
You can also throw a dollar to my Patreon face if you want to. I'll leave a link in the description down there. Uh, once we start doing decks again, I'll let you know what decks we're doing the day before we do them if you're a dollar member on Patreon. So that's pretty good. Plus, especially towards the beginning of the format, you'll get to vote on what decks you want to see the most. So, a dollar a month actually gets you a lot of a lot of play. So, just throw me a dollar if you can, if you can afford it. I can understand if you don't. Um, and if you don't, I'm just happy that you're here. Seriously, thanks for watching. It was a long video. Um, and there's a lot more of you lately. I've been getting a lot more views on spoiler videos. So if you're new to the channel, thanks for being here. That's awesome. I'm glad you have stuck around and enjoy how I do things around here. So if you haven't subbed, do all that stuff yet. Because I really want to see you around here all the time. But in any case, I think I'm tapped out for now. But I will see you later. I'll catch you cats later. I am Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Make sure, no matter what you do, you spread love and you be kind.